Hi, it's Brendan Chapman here, and welcome back to another episode of Strength and Conditioning TV. I'm here with Ian Fisher. How are you doing today, Fish? Good, Brent. Always good to always good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. And today we want to talk a little bit about training environment, in particular, what makes a good training environment. And you can probably see that there's there's not a lot of fancy equipment in this small space that we're in at Yorkshire County Cricket. But Ian, I know you guys have got a number of different training venues. So you've got here where we are now at the stadium, the cricket nets, and there's a platform here, there's squat rack, bench press, pull-ups, boxes. There's a smaller gym there which has, again, another squat rack and some dumbbells and the wall bars, that kind of thing. But you also have access to David Lloyd, which I know you utilise. So just talk to us a little bit about the structure of your training programme and what you do where, and then we can get into the environment as well. So I think what, what the difference is largely is that in the, in the summer, or mainly around the cricket, we do all our training exclusively at the club. So mm. um, we do have access to David Lloyd, which is a big commercial gym, but um, we really want to fully Im immerse and integrate strength conditioning into the larger cricket programme around games, training, all the, all the other facets of all the other facets of training for our sport. Um, having our gym close to our practice facility is absolutely crucial to that because mm. you want guys to be going, yes, I've done my skills, but now I'm going to go do this. I'm going to yeah. go and develop physically as well. Mm. And in the pre-season, you still use Lo David Lloyd a little bit, but when you're doing your preparation work there, what sort of training do you do at David Lloyd versus the performance facilities that you've got here? We only do our sort of strength training sessions up at David Lloyd purely because it, it's, it is a nice environment for the guys, which is good in some respects, not in, not in every respect. You know, it's got a cafe, it's got a pool, it's got yeah. you know, a good spa facility. So the guys can, especially in the winter and the pre-season when we're not outdoors playing cricket, it's, it's, the guys, it's nice for the guys to go there so they can have a, a day at just working, working at their sort of physical development have a coffee after and you know enjoy that enjoy that side of the day rather than business like at the ground which yeah. i think's sort of the separation of it yeah yeah and what do you feel goes into a performance environment what are the key things for you as a strength and conditioning coach that you're looking for to to build and nurture in in your own training culture i think the the environment's influenced by a few different factors i mean Largely, you need the right characters in there. You need a couple of really good cultural architects as a... I like that phrase. That's a good phrase. You need, uh, you need a good backing of your support staff, coaches. You know, in particular, you need them to be saying, you know, backing up whatever you're saying rather yeah. than it being a separate entity. So you know, once, you get, once you select your cultural architect or a couple of key players, you've got to empower them a little bit and get them get them um, leading the session a little bit and that almost you know it creates a little bit more energy because you know running sessions on a day-to-day -day basis with the same group of athletes there's only so much energy you can give them all yourself you know yeah. there's only you know it's one voice where that's where you've got to try and empower more people in the right environment to create that sort of energy and the sort of environment that really leads to high performance. I totally agree I mean I think the cultural architect thing is critical, and it's it's critical in both ways. It's critical to have great cultural architects, but it's also critical to kind of shape those potentially negative cultural architects who have a, a slightly detrimental effect on the environment. And that's certainly, in, when I look back at my experience over the last decade or so, they're some of the biggest challenges I've faced as a coach is working with those characters that really don't want to do what you want them to do. Mm. They really do have no interest in it, or little interest, quite disruptive. But your job and our job as a coach is to shape that environment, to make it into a performance culture. And the only way to do that is to kind of work with those people, isn't it? You do have these guys who can be a little bit energy sapping, you know, they can take a little bit from the group. Um, and if you're not careful, you can end up spending your whole time chasing these guys around, trying to make guys do things where what I've tried to do in my experience 
is firstly work with the the guys who are really keen to participate Re you get good buy-in get those going first because that can influence the environment mm. can drag those sort of there can be a few middle liars as well that go yeah that fall either side of the fence so the better you can create the the environment then you slip a few more that mm. that way and hopefully that's you isolate a couple of guys at anybody yeah. who is sapping anything from the group. So mm. that's how I try and look at it because I, you know, especially at first, I used to spend my whole time mm. chasing that guy, having a lot of conversations about people that, mm. that weren't particularly that, that good for the group. And it's, it's a really challenging one because you're quite often, you're better off spending, instead of spending twice the effort on that individual, you're spending twice the effort on the people who do want that information. Mm. And I think that will drag others into it, as you say. Um, but sometimes there comes a point where you've got to actually really work on those individuals. And I remember a time that I was working in rugby league and the most powerful character or two characters in the gym mm. were, were people who were negative towards the gym. Yeah. So there weren't many that I could kind of draw on. There was, there was two or three, but they weren't strong leaders. They were good examples, mm. but they weren't individuals I could really draw on for support. So every single practice session, I was going down with a new, like, right, I'm going to try this with him tonight. And I'd pull him out of the gym and say, look, this is for you. This is, so this program, I've designed it for you, and I need you to do this, and this is the intensity you need to work at. And it lasted 10 minutes. And then it'd go back to what it was before. And so it's, some people you've kind of, it, it, it's super, super challenge. Um, but you're unlucky, I think, if you get such a strongly defined group like that. Yeah. Um, and, and I think you're right in that if you do get those two or three that are very, very positive, work on those guys first and hopefully they'll drag the other guys through, won't they? Mm. So we've talked a little bit there about the people. And interestingly, you might not necessarily nominate a David Lloyd type environment as a as a performance environment, but important point to say is that the team, the people, can overcome that. Hmm. And in your case with with Yorkshire, it's it's very much the case, isn't it? Being perfectly honest, the, the David Lloyd sessions that we do are not our best sessions of the week, you know. But as a holistic package to our players, it's important for them. Hmm. We get better sessions done when we're here and it's you know crank the music up just yeah. have some turn it into a hard work environment straight off straight out of the cricket practice right we're in the gym next lads let's go get your programs out get some music on and let's let's smash it now mm. so those sessions i think are, are better for physical development when we're here but like i say as a as a holistic package you still need guys to be enjoy coming to training and part of the David Lloyd package or the you know health club package is that guys enjoy it you know mm, yeah and obviously your time working with me with the guys that we had in a kind of beaten up gym with the music cramped, cranked up it, they, they're powerful and it, it's summarised really with that kind of the line you've got to get the right people in the right place so you get the right people there you work on those cultural architects but then you have the right place as well. And that is different for everyone. So what does the right place look like when it comes to really good performance environment for you? I think it's a little bit about what you've got in your, in your gym. You know, mm. I, I also believe in, you know, keeping an orderly gym. You know, I, mm. I think, um, I read something just the other day about, um, about creating structure and good habits. And if you want structure, you need to provide structure. So, if I do a, a warm up, say I'm doing a warm up on the field, I like it to be sequenced. So they go from one station to the next station to the next. So it has a little bit of order because I want guys to have repeatable habits on game days and on training days. You know, you want them to say, well, yeah, I always take my roller because I roll and then I do this and then I do that and then I do that and then I do my session and then I do that and I have my nutrition and then I go home. So I like to, I think good environments provide a structure and sort of a way of making repeatable habits possible. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's good thoughts. And in terms of equipment and the kind of the, the actual tools that you have in there, um, we know that we need to have the ability to, to lift heavy. We know we need good flooring. We know we need 
the the robustness of the equipment that will last and 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 also that creates that culture of actually now we can do that yeah because you've got that in there it's like right now we can if you're not allowed to drop the weights then you can't drop the weights so you can't do that about, exercise I was just about to say that you know, you know? when the, f the first time somebody drops something you know you're like yeah it's it, a breakthrough yeah it? if you're in a commercial gym and you're dropping things like people are looking around at you but you yeah know, you know, drop it. It's part. It's part of it. You know, if you're lifting to a good intensity, at some point you're gonna have to drop something. Down. You're gonna have to drop it, and if you've got a heavy dumbbell in your hand and you need to get it over your head, you've got to do it fast. Yeah. So you've got to have that in, input there and that intensity and that intent into your sessions, haven't you? And, mm. and the environment encourages that with the right equipment and the right layout and space and things like that, doesn't it? And you sort of um, you get these opportunities when you might be the first change of program or first session of the winter or whatever way you can really set the tone with your own actions and um, you know you do a demo you smash something out and then throw it on the floor and then it's like whoa hang on a minute that's and then that We're suddenly yeah that. suddenly then yeah. it's everything's fair game yeah. when it, you know yeah. like I say that you've got to pick these key windows because at times you sort of got to sit back and let your let the players or the athletes clients drive your environment but you do get these windows where you can really sculpt the sculpt the culture, and I think that's that's when you've got to recognise, you know, when they are. You see, there's a couple of environments that I've been privy to over my career, and uh, the the mixed martial arts environment with Danny Mitchell and the AVT team, and and the number of different facilities they've got is a fantastic <laughs> example of the right people in the right place. But the right place doesn't look that nice. So if, if tennis players went in there, it wouldn't be the right place. Yeah, It'd be very, very different. And so different cultures, different beliefs, different backgrounds lead to a different place that facilitates that optimal development. So the gym that I'm talking about had mats that were ripped and um, there was leaks in the roof necessarily that were being plugged up. So it didn't look like a nice gym, but for those guys, it was tough, it was grimy, it was, it was facilitating hard work. And that's not going to work for a sport that just doesn't respond like that. It, it might not work for cricket, it might not work for other, golf, for example. Exactly. If you're building warriors, you need a Spartan environment, don't yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. You need it. You You've got to create that hunger. Yeah, exactly. But then the argument is then, it, would the golfers be better in that environment if they if they need more hunger or, you know, we, for example, at British Tennis, you know, I went in there and they had a, a, an absolutely amazing headquarters at Roehampton with, you know, tennis, tennis courts with heated flooring to adapt to the different environments over the world. They had um, Hawkeye embedded into it. They had swimming pools and literally everything, gym, it, the lot. But yet, maybe that, hardness that wasn't the right place hmm. for them you know you, when you compare it to the te the one concrete tennis court in russia that's produced you know 20 of the top 100 women's tennis players for example over the last that is, it 10 is, years it's absolutely that's fascinating though isn't it that how yeah. you can do i build a world-class environment because i want world-class or build a world-class facility because i want our, our players i our athletes to believe the world class and have everything that um, you could possibly want for in terms of physical development or do we need to earn that first do we need to earn those um, do we need to earn it before we can yeah. we can have that environment so it's a it's a balance mm. it's a balance I'm sure you know I hear it a little bit you know because we're a cricket club we're not a you know we're not a billion dollar business mm. we run on a fairly tight budget so I hear it a bit from the players, oh, I bet this doesn't happen at Man United, you know, we don't have to wash our own shakers at Man United or, um, but, you know, we're not Man United, so, yeah. you know, yeah. we're not, we haven't won so many yeah. Premier Leagues, Champions Leagues. And then when you read, like, the Let Your Book Legacy, we're about the New Zealand All Blacks, yeah. and it's talking about them Literally. cleaning up their own changing rooms and sweeping them out and cleaning their own boots and things like that, and it just shows you, well, there's room, it is a balance, there's room for, no matter what level of success, you got to come back to earth. There's some great um, quotes in that legacy book. Mm. It's like um, it's like a book referencing all the all the best books that you should have read. Mm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's perfect for um, someone like me. Yeah. It <laughs> yeah, exactly. that, it's like that'll do for me. That's it. For me. Yeah. But things like you know, um, if we want better All Blacks, we need better people. And you know, so it's about developing people and moving the making the shirt 
better mm. and you know there's a lot yeah. of good there's a lot of great sort of take home yeah. quotes yeah. and quite inspiring it's very influential yeah. yeah yeah and a bit like um, I remember Stuart Yule talking about the triple impact approach yeah, yeah. that he uses at, at Glasgow through Gregor Townsend everything they do every action that they take every behaviour every session has got a benefit not just the player but the players the team and the club mm. as well so whatever they do has got to add into that and yeah. And, and, and you, you can call people on that when you've got those values. It's like, that's not benefiting the club. Hmm. You know, Absolutely. What, and it holds them accountable to it. It's really important to have those values and that mantra, isn't it? Yeah. And one thing, I, th I might be just jumping um, topics slightly here, but one thing that I think if you're working in team sport environments, you've got to understand what drives team sport. And for me, largely it's competition. So, like, that just... Um, Reminding me there, Stuart, you allowed they rung the personal best bell every time somebody got a, a personal best in the gym. They rung the bell because, you know, the you know the testosterone-driven environment, mm. rugby club. They want uh, they want to be getting PBs, and cricketers are pretty similar. They want they want to be beating their mates. It's yeah. all about competition. I can you can run whatever drill you want, but make it about beating you, beating your yeah. peers, and yeah. the session's much better. Yeah. So feedback-based training and that yeah. sort of. Um, creating those, creating those chances to mm. be the best or beat your mates or beat you know yeah. make sure you don't lose to the quick the feedback is key, isn't it? It yeah. just really just develops that for sure. And that's what our players thrive on that. And we can't do that, at David Lloyd, but we can do that in our environment. We can mm. set up some gates and mm. first you know best time here, yeah. best time here, or you know it's it's um, that's when our players when we get the best environment from our players. Great point. Really good point. So I think ultimately it's about kind of reviewing that mantra, the right people in the right place. Because looking at the people in the, in the environment, who the architects are, who shape it positively and negatively, it'll allow you to see a bigger picture about where you need to do your work. And then looking at the, the right place and thinking, is this conducive to the goal of this session? Is it, is it giving me that? Is it allowing that instant feedback? Is it... Is it creating that competitive culture uh, or is competitive culture not what you're after right now with that group and it's reviewing and auditing those two factors and I think you can therefore go out there and improve and create a, a better more influential environment and training culture and that's where the results really happen isn't it absolutely thanks for watching guys this is Brendan Chaplin and Ian Fisher on strength and conditioning tv we'll be back again soon